welcome back to Cosmic Comics. Spawn Issue 2, Questions Part 2, published in July of 1992. Dedication on this one goes to Steve Ditko, who is probably most famously known as the co-creator of Spider-Man. Story, Pencils, and Inks by Todd McFarlane. Letters, Tom Orzachowski. Editor, Wanda Kalamajic. Color, Steve Olaf and Ruben Rude in Alioptics. Alioptics is a studio that works with the digitization of comic art. Questions continues as Al Simmons searches for answers. Who is the woman in his head? Who set him up and what has he become? This issue gives us the first appearance of Violator. Often this character will go by the name Clown while in human form and save the use of the name Violator for when he shifts into his demonic form. But for the duration of his earliest appearances, he's only called Violator. On Violator's face is a painted pattern similar to the M-shaped pattern found on Spawn's costume. Violator is having a conversation with a cat, telling it all the disgusting ways he's going to mutilate Spawn when they fight. Violator is looking forward to this fight and has been tasked with striking fear into the new Hellspawn's heart. He continues to relish in how much fun he's going to have tonight and how much he's going to impress his boss. As he wraps up, he states that he would hate to be Spawn. This is significant because it's the first time the word Spawn is used in the comic and it doesn't show up until issue number two. Al is moping on a church roof, wondering how he's going to find his wife and how he'll react when they finally do meet. He doesn't remember any solid details from his life. He remembers a wife whose name he can't remember, and he remembers making a deal for his soul. For the last two days, Al has been hiding in a dark alley, hoping that he might wake up, that everything going on around him is really just a bad dream. Al believes his memories, which are coming to him in bits and pieces, are purposely being parsed out. He feels that he got screwed over in the deal. He regained his life, but in the process he lost his identity. Why would Wanda even want a monster like him in her life? She may not like the way he looks, but right now she's still Al's biggest lead on his past. The church he's at right now is the same church he came to in issue number one. He feels drawn to the church, which he thinks could be a clue. The costume now feels more comfortable than his real skin. Violator appears on a nearby rooftop, waving at Spawn before disappearing into the shadows. So, what is up with this moment? Why does Violator show up and then leave? We move forward in time to later, presumably the same night where Violator has bypassed New York City's organized crime's impenetrable and unbeatable security system. A lackey is seen running down the hallway while his boss calls for help, but the door needs to be opened from the inside. All of this security is put into place to show that Violator can come and go as he pleases. The fact that he gets in without bloodshed, violence, or triggering alarms implies some form of teleportation ability. Violator reaches through the door and rips out the man's heart. This establishes Violator as the murderer Sam and Twitch are looking for who continues killing Mafia hitmen by ripping their hearts out of their chest. And this first shot of Violator as Violator is just gruesome, horrifying, alien, and absolutely beautiful. As for the newscasters, our 2 Today anchor has now moved over to 44 viewers' choice. He verifies that the police have reported at least six Mafia hitmen who have had their hearts removed, and the killer is being referred to as the Heart Surgeon. He pointedly ends his piece complaining that the police should stop investigating somebody who is doing a public service. The recent spat of criminal killings leads to some of the city's most powerful men with connections to criminal activities to seek police protection. As part of the news, we get an update on Wanda Blake, who is using money from her late husband's memorial fund to open a care clinic for disabled children. It's pointed out that this is the third project of this type she's been involved with. The entertainment news panel is used for shameless cross-promotional marketing of other Image comics. 
Youngblood and Savage Dragon both get a nod here, with the bold claim that in the Spawniverse, Youngblood has sold over $2 billion in goods and are more popular than the Ninja Turtles. While the world turns, Al sits and mopes on top of the church and attempts to figure things out. At the moment, he's feeling overwhelmed. All he wanted to do was see and hold his wife. Now, he's not even sure if he's alive or even a man. So, Al decides to use his powers to try and make himself whole again. He lets loose a burst of necrotic energy, which turns him into a white man. The setup and timing of this is perfect. Consider that Todd McFarlane lets the reader in on the joke before the character knows what's going on. Now I turn the page and I get to see the confused Al. It gives Todd an entire page to explore Al's confusion about his skin color. Al sees that he's white and puts forth a- another blast of necrotic energy. Still white. Again, Al lashes out with the necrotic energy, and again he remains white. He doesn't understand. And, dear viewer, as of the year 2021, when I write this, um, almost 25 years later, we still don't have a full explanation for why this takes place in the manner that it does. We have learned one important fact about what is taking place here. The appearance that Al takes on is that of a man named Jim Downing. I don't want to give away too many spoilers too early, but at a point way down the road, Jim Downing becomes the story's protagonist for an extended period of time. Not months, but years. While Spawn works through his skin pigment issues, Violator is busy ripping the heart out of Gino, who gets to live for two panels. Al decides he'd rather look deformed than white. To me, this isn't about skin color, it's about identity. Al wants to be made whole. He wants to be the old Al. He wants to be able to go and see his wife and for things to be like they used to be. Al's inability to make himself look like his physical self prior to death, his inability to reclaim his identity, makes Al lose his temper, and he starts screaming that he's ready for a fight. After this outburst, Al is hit with another memory dump. We saw this same panel here last issue, but are now officially introduced to Jason Wynn, Al's boss at the time he was murdered. Al most likely began working for Jason Wynn at some point after he saved the president's life from assassination, as it's implied that the president personally saw to it that Jason Wynn acted as a mentor to Al Simmons. Jason taught Al how to fight, kill, and obey. Al was already a soldier, so I thought those were all things he was supposed to do when ordered. Wynn and Simmons eventually became like brothers, until Al began noticing that Wynn was covering things up. It all comes down to the fact that Wynn is more concerned about harnessing power than spreading democracy, and in the process he was willing to break the rules and limit freedoms in order to accomplish his goals. Al, on the other hand, was more idealistic. Al was angry that America was acting like a bully and even angrier that his longtime friend just didn't care. But it went further than that. Jason Wynn, he enjoyed causing other people pain. Jason Wynn is evil. The memory flash leads to Al falling off the church steeple and landing in the alley below. His necroplasm meter has dropped by over 500 points from the repeated outburst. While Al lays face down in the alley, Violator keeps killing Mafia men, but he's getting bored and leaves to go check on Al. The first interaction between these two is great. I'm not sure that I ever noticed this before, and I don't think that Al is meant to be addressing Violator here, but the first thing he ever says to him really when they're sort of in a face-to-face -face capacity, is help. And Violator jumps right in, ready to help. He gives Al a hard time about looking drunk while admitting that even though it's two in the morning, he's wired. Spawn wants to know how he ended up with his mask back on, and Violator tells him that he was the one that put it back on. 
that's interesting because we later learn that the costume can act independently from Al, and it's curious that it would have allowed Violator to do that. There is another possibility, and that's that Violator is just lying. As Al's wits return, he recognizes the man in front of him as the one he saw waving from a rooftop. Violator then tells Al that he knows that Al is THE Spawn, which is short for Hell Spawn. Al wants to know how this man knows him and if he knows where his wife is. As a funny aside, Violator complains about Al using the Lord's name in vain because it hurts his ears. Afterwards, Violator starts spewing off a list of all the ways he could hurt or maim Spawn, followed by asking Al if he's scared. Remember, he told us on the second page that it was his job to scare Al. He's got a good, intimidating groove going on, but then he stops in the middle of his rant to zip up his pants. This sort of begins to play into the occasional slapstickish tropes of this particular character. In response, Spawn tells him, this guy, his best lead so far, that he doesn't have time for him, and walks away. I have to say, in the moment, this panel feels very untrue. Al wants answers, and then he walks away from those potential answers. As Spawn walks away, Violator starts getting twinkly stars around him, culminating in the issue's big reveal. That the creature that has been ripping hearts out is the short little fat guy. We are left with the promise of a battle between these two next issue. Um, Let's jump back into the issue real quick to check on Sam and Twitch. I could go into great depth discussing these two, who they are, and how they relate to each other, but we're going to have time to get to know these two extremely well on down the line. The detectives are currently under a massive amount of pressure. These two now have six homicide cases on their desk, and the media, their boss, and powerful people in the city all want to see these cases solved. The biggest development here is... While reading the paper, Sam takes interest in an article about a costume freak hiding in the alleyways. And to follow up on the final page of this issue, years down the line, we know that Clown and Violator are the same entity. It's not a big secret, but back then we had no idea. Find a copy of this one, pull it out, and look at the structure of the narrative in this comic, and... And you'll see how it shows once again how Todd McFarlane is great at holding back information to create a more emotional impact. It isn't until the very last panel that new readers learn that Violator and the short Fat Man are one and the same. Unfortunately, the end of this issue gets the reader excited for a battle that doesn't erupt in earnest until issue number four. I'm not going to continue doing the spawn quotes at the end. It was a nice idea, but it's not really functional and gets in the way of the end cards. Thanks for watching Cosmic Comics. I'm out.